least they look strange to these people, even though we have hundreds of years of tradition behind us, it looks strange to them because they're simply not taught. The attorneys are simply not taught this stuff. They, they have no clue. And coming from you, well, you have no authority as far as they're concerned. You know, what, what do you know? But you know a lot if you follow these procedures. So I'm just emphasizing this is, attitude is a big, big factor, much bigger than we really anticipate. And we get a lot of behind the scenes help from people that we could never prove we were helped, but I've seen judges do 180 degree turnarounds mysteriously. Just there were tigers on the bench and suddenly they became like kittens. They were very nice and cooperative and so forth. Part of that was because of the fact that we fenced them in with the real law. But a big part of it also was the fact that they liked us. In one case we had I remember this judge just absolutely raking the attorney over the coals. Uh, it was spontaneous, you know, we weren't expecting it. We didn't even have any motion that was even close to it. But this judge went into a tirade against the attorney and told the attorney, you know, that the attorney was the one that was responsible for the delays in this case. And the, the attorney wasn't doing her homework and the attorney wasn't doing her research. And I mean, he just went on and on for about five minutes on this attorney. And, and this was an attorney who had five years of experience in the court system. And, uh, and but the, I mean, when we went into that courtroom, we always said, hi, Your Honor, and nice to see you, and so forth, you know, and then we got down to business, of course. But on a personal level, it, it was just fine. And I know that these people will stab you in the back first chance you get, they get, you know, but uh, uh, they, 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 when, they're, when they like you, it takes a big chunk of energy out of their, their, uh, their sails there. Yeah, wind out of their sails. So this is, uh, uh, attitude is not law directly, but boy, it sure can have some surprisingly good effects if you have a good attitude. Okay, well, enough of attitude. Now we have uh, language and dictionaries. Now, language and dictionaries, basically in America, we all speak three languages. We, the the uh, low-level language is called slang, okay? That's the language of the street. It changes from moment to moment, from block to, blo to block, okay? So, uh, um, and slang has some very interesting uh, uh, features in it, you know? You, so the formal English is our second language, and, and in order for strangers to communicate, we have to be educated in, in formal English or business English, if you want to call it that. And so that, that's a, an important language too. But it is a separate language. Even though it's also called English, it's a language that's separate from the slang version. And then there's the language of the court, sometimes called the King's English or Legal English. And that is, that's a very, very stable language. That, you know, a word means the same thing today that it meant 300 years ago. And um, presence is very important. And the, the legal dictionary is far larger than Webster's unabridged dictionary. If you, the legal dictionary, uh, if you go to the law library, the legal dictionary is not called a dictionary. It's actually called words and phrases, okay? Or you'll see that it's uh, the restatement of the law. That's another name for it. Or American jurisprudence. These, these, are all, these are all dictionaries, as far as we're concerned, dictionaries of the English language. And if I remember the word to, spelled T-O. I remember it took several pages of court cases where battles were fought over the meaning of the word to. It really surprised me when I first saw that. So be sure when you, when you are using the language, be sure that you're speaking the right language and you know that language. When you, uh, one exercise that you could do that I did is just sit down with the Constitution and one of these dictionaries and every single word, just pretend you never saw the language before, and every single word, no matter how simple it is, you know, what it starts off, we, W-E, Look it up. You'd be surprised what that word means when you're talking legal language. And uh, so if you did that, that would give you a tremendous uh, uh, force, you know, uh, intellectual force behind you. 
to, the, to make you more effective in writing your papers. It also makes you more effective in, in undermining the opposition because often these attorneys, you see when the attorneys go to law school, sure they're taught a few meanings and so forth, but they're not actually told that it's a separate language. They don't realize that. And they will go in there, a lot of times you'll hear attorneys on the floor of the court speaking business English. <laughs> you know, you can just chop them up with, with uh, if, you, if you pretend that they were speaking legal English, you can really screw them up, okay? They, uh, because they don't know, they're not educated. Um, attorneys are remarkably ignorant. I, I don't mean to downgrade attorneys because I'm not saying they're dumb. They're very intelligent. A lot of them are extremely intelligent, okay? But being intelligent isn't good enough. You also have to use the right words. If you don't speak the right language, you can get in trouble in the courtroom. Um, I think a, a very common misuse of word is the word resonant, okay? You know, uh, you ask anybody on the street what the word resident means, and resident means, well, you know, you live there, you, you, you belong here, right? That's your normal meaning for the word resident in, in everyday English. But when you get into the courtroom, the word resident means you're a foreigner, and you're here for a specific purpose, and once you accomplish that purpose, you're going to go home. If you're a resident of California, that means you're from someplace outside California and you've got some purpose and they assume it's a commercial purpose. Why do they assume it's a commercial purpose? Very simple. The Constitution of the United States authorizes Congress to, to regulate interstate commerce. And so if you say you're a resident of California, that means you're from outside the state, you've crossed the border, you've got a commercial purpose and therefore they're entitled to regulate you. And that's by authority of the people who gave them the Constitution. So, very important to understand that word resident. Now, if you don't want to be a resident under those terms, the proper word is domiciled, okay? If you're domiciled, that means you belong here. You don't need any excuse. This is where you live, this is where you belong. But if you're a resident, I'll show you an example of a common use of the word resident that is proper, that does match up with the legal meaning. And that is where a doctor does his residency in the hospital, right? He went to school, he got his MD, but he's not allowed to practice medicine, not till he completes his residency. So he goes into the jurisdiction of the hospital, crosses the border, he now subjects himself to their, their instructions and, and command. He goes through all the hoops that they, that they have him jump through, and then once he completes the program successfully, he leaves. He leaves the hospital, goes out into private practice, and he, com he has completed his residency. So there's a, a, a really good example of, of what residence means. So anyway, make sure you get your language right when you write your papers. And please, please pay attention to your spell checker, okay, on your, on your word processor. If you, put in, if you put in paperwork with misspellings, I mean, some of the stuff I see is pretty sad. And believe me, when you put in bad uh, spelling, the opposition looks at it and they figure one way or another they're going to beat you. You're too ignorant. Okay? So you can't do that. If you, if you have trouble spelling, for Pete's sake, go down to one of the secretarial services and have a, hire a secretary to read your paperwork and correct the spelling and correct the language. You know, sometimes we use slang without realizing it. So uh, a, a good executive secretary can do a lot to save your paperwork from from being disrespected. Okay. All right, let's get into the meat of this. People or citizen, which one are you? Basically, the people own the country and the country owns the citizens. That's the basic relationship. So which do you want to be? You want to be a people or do you want to be a citizen? You cannot be both at the same time. However, if you're one of the people, you can choose when you want to be a citizen. You can be a citizen for some purposes and not a citizen for, for other purposes. Now, how do you know whether or not you're a people? Well, if you look at the preamble, well, let's back up. Let's go into the history. The, when the United States declared its independence from uh, uh, Great Britain, uh, 
king george wasn't too happy about that 